Good evening. Open up with me, if you will, to the book of Ezra. See how far we get tonight. Hey, welcome. For those of you that love genealogies, we got a big list of names in chapter two. Um, by way of background, if you haven't been with us through our study, we just finished up Second Chronicles. And we have seen the nation of Israel divided. And the northern kingdom consistently had evil kings, bad kings. And the southern region had a mixture, had good kings, bad kings. Oftentimes we saw this pattern, even when the kings were good, that they would start out good, but they wouldn't finish strong. And that was kind of an emphasis as we went through um, the Chronicles. Ezra, the book of Ezra holds the, the name Ezra. But you'll see, if you, if you were to break this up in an outline, really, Ezra doesn't even show up until like chapter 7. So the first six chapters are really the reconstruction of the temple under the leadership of Zerubbabel. And then chapter 7 through 10, worship is restored in the uh, temple under the leadership of Ezra. So if you're an outline person... We're going to do a little bit of cross-referencing, but we'll pray and then we'll get started because I think there's some really amazing prophecy that is so easy to miss if you just start reading Ezra. So let's pray. Father, <coughs> Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather. Lord, I, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll enable me to communicate your word effectively. Lord, that you'll prepare our hearts to hear and to receive and to, to get everything that you would desire for us to get out of this, Lord, to, to have application for today in our lives. So, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Ezra chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Verse 3, Who among you of all his people may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So by way of context, you guys remember, basically, the Judah was commanded by God to have a Sabbath year in the growing of their crops. So in the sixth year, every seventh year, they were to let the land recuperate, let the land rest. In the sixth year, God would bless them and provide abundantly in the fields. And then they were supposed to take that excess and use it in the seventh year. And it wasn't so much, I don't think, about letting the land rest as it was letting the people know that they could count on God. They could be dependent on him and they could trust him. Unfortunately, what we saw over and over and over again, that six year would be a huge blessing, just exactly as, as the Lord had said. And then they would say the seventh year, that's just bonus. That's gravy. We'll just stockpile that. So they, they neglected the word of the Lord. They neglected the Sabbath year for 490 years. So they owed the Lord 70 years of Sabbath. So he, he said, basically, you haven't done it, and you haven't done it, and you haven't done it, so we'll let the land lie desolate. It'll be destroyed, and you won't, you won't be there. So Babylon comes in, and, and they take them out as exiles, and the land is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. So that's, that's where we're picking up in Ezra. That's happened. And then when we read this, verse 1 through 4 in Ezra, 
it looks like this king is saying, okay, guys, you can all go back home and rebuild your temple, and I'm going to kick in some change towards that. I'm going to help you out and pay for it. Does that make any sense apart from God, apart from God's intervention? That's, that's one of the themes in the book of Ezra is redemption, the redemption of God. And interesting, we can see you looking for application to our lives today. That's, Jesus does the same thing for us, guys. He does for us what we can't do ourselves. He, he frees us from captivity. He takes us out of bondage. So, and then he provides for us. But so they're in captivity. And the, the king says, uh, verse 2, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who among you, of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of God? So you guys are, are free. And like I said, as I read that, that doesn't make any sense to me unless you look at the other bits of prophecy that are connected to it. So Daniel... When, when they were taken into captivity by Babylon, there were some, some people we would know that, that were also taken captive. A guy named Daniel. And who were his companions? Shadrach, Reshach, and Medigo. So even though he's a, in captivity, he rose to a position of power where he was a, a consultant, basically, to the leadership. So if we look at Daniel chapter 9, and let me just say, prior to this, in Daniel chapter 8, you can look that up later, but Daniel had previously prophesied some amazing things about Babylon. Babylon came in and was this superpower and completely takes over Jerusalem, pulls all the people out to exile. And then Daniel prophesies, you know what, Babylon, this isn't going to work out because the, the Medo-Persians are actually going to come and take you over. And that actually happened in uh, 530 B.C., so Daniel had had this prophecy. And then in Daniel chapter 9, uh, after this power had changed, Daniel says in, in first, verse 1, In the first year of Darius, the son of Asarias, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the numbers of years specified by the word of the Lord through who? Jeremiah, the prophet. So Daniel said, hey, listen, I've been studying the word of God. And as a result of that, some things have been revealed to me. There's some things that the prophet Jeremiah makes plain to us. So they're in captivity. And, and when we see this, Daniel goes on, uh, the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Verse 3, then I set my face toward the Lord God, to make requests by prayer and supplications with fastings, sackcloth and ashes. If you go on in chapter 9, he asks the Lord for wisdom. God, you've revealed these things to me through your word. So now what do I do with that? What do you want me to do? And imagine the, the uh, encouragement that that would have been to the captives. You know, you're pulled out of Jerusalem. You see the temple, which was the center of Jewish life for a thousand years, this magnificent temple destroyed. And then... You, you're taken into captivity, and you're reading this. And, and the word of Jeremiah makes it plain. This is not going to last forever. This is coming close to an end. God says that it's 70 years. We'll look at that. Um, Daniel actually very likely could have spoke to Cyrus, the ruler, and said, hey, check out what the word of God says. So I, I want to I want to look at that and Jeremiah, what he's referring to when he says it was made plain by the prophet Jeremiah. If you go all the way back to Jeremiah twenty five, starting in verse eleven, verses eleven through thirteen, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then it will come to pass when seventy years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I will bring on that land all my words, which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah has prophesied 
concerning the nations. So right there, he sees this is going to last for 70 years. And he gets excited about it. And, and what am I supposed to do with that? And then remember, last week, I talked about your refrigerator magnet verses, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans. Um, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And then we, we backed up a verse and we looked at that in context. That's exactly what Daniel did. Verse 10, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I'll visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. Think about that, guys. If you're in captivity and you're hearing that and it's like, this is coming to a close and I'm going to return you to this place. How encouraging that would have been. And then he goes on and he says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. And, and what might they be thinking about God at that point when they're taken out of Jerusalem and they're in captivity? God, have you forgotten me? Here's what I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Verse 12, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. So I'm going to allow this to happen because you didn't obey my word, but I'm going to restore you and bring you back to the land. So uh, Imagine, again, the encouragement that that must have been to the captives hearing that. And then, so Daniel comes across that. He comes across that writing. And very likely he shared that and shared a prophecy from the book of Isaiah with Cyrus. Check this out. Isaiah chapter 44, starting in verse 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited to the cities of Judah, you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places, who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers? Who says of, what does that say? This is what is amazing, guys. This was written between 150 and 190 years before Cyrus was born. This prophecy was written. So can you imagine Dan Daniel laying this out before the king? Hey, these guys came captive. You took them captive. You were a pawn. The Lord used you to do this. And this is only going to last 70 years. And check this out. Cyrus, it says, before you were born, it was prophesied that you were going to do this. He's my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. And to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, chapter 45, again, to Cyrus, named him by name whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and lose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob... My servant's sake, in Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name, Cyrus. I've named you, though you have not known me. Even though you didn't know me, I knew you before you were born, he says. I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine the response a king would have if a prophet came and told him this. He'd say, hey, get out of my, get out of here, guys. Not only can you go free, not only can you go back to Jerusalem, but I'm going to fund this. I'm going to support you in doing this. Amazing. Amazing. Again, as Daniel laid this out and the people saw this and they saw God's hand, they were in captive, captivity 70 years, right? But this was written 150, 190 years before Cyrus, Cyrus was even born. So God was in control the whole time. 
And when they see these things and read these things, knowing the word of God is going to come true, it had to be encouraging. And guys, we should be in the same place, I believe, today, especially if you've been going to this end times prophecies and you've been listening and following along where we've been in our study of Luke and just following the signs of the times, how close we are to the return of the Lord. So back in Ezra, actually, no, finish up Isaiah. Uh, 45 verse 5, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though, I have not, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none other. So back in Ezra. It says, Then the heads of the fathers, houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirits had been moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around with them, all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things. Beside all that was willingly offered. So the 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 Cyrus willingly offered the, the things and the people willingly gave offerings. Now, kind of an interesting thing when you look at the history of this, probably about 2 million Jews were taken into exile in Babylon and only about 50,000. The, the numbers vary when you look at the, the um, commentaries between 50,000 and 150,000 returned. It, but I, I want you to understand that not only was the king excited, the people were excited, they were stirred up, but not all of them. They've been in captivity for 70 years. So some of them were born in captivity. Some of them had never even seen Jerusalem. And then there was others that kind of blended into the culture in Babylon. They, the, the whole reason why they were exiled, again, not just because of abusing the Sabbath, but idolatry. And they, they had turned themselves over to idolatry. And the Lord said, if that's what you want, Babylon is known for that. I'm going to give you what you want. So they went and they, they um, acclimated to that culture, became a part of that culture, intermarried with that culture. So not all of them wanted to go, but the Lord said that a remnant would return. And that's exactly what we have here. So not all of them had even seen the, return, the uh, original temple. And... The other thing is, I want you guys to understand that this was a huge step of faith on their, their behalf. They were not returning to the glorious city of Jerusalem. They were returning to a war zone, right? It completely destroyed a desolate war zone. The roads, no roads. It would have looked like downtown Bangor. All potholes and tore up and terrible. Worse than Bangor, maybe, you know? So they, they weren't going back to a place where there were subdivisions and gated communities and, and all the things that they knew, not that that, was that, that that was there before, but their homesteads were no longer there. It had been destroyed and it had been vacant, unlike some of the other people groups that would come in and they would occupy a place they took in. Jerusalem was desolate. It was empty. So this was a huge step of faith in, in them doing this. Verse 7 says, King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Shishbazar, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives. They list out the number of the articles there. Verse... Um, 11 says all the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. All these Sheshbazar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. So again, they weren't just motivated. They weren't just excited, but there was actually a, a restoration of the things that had been taken, the things that were gone, the articles of the Lord that had been sanctified and set apart for the use of the Lord. And they were robbed and stolen by Nebuchadnezzar. In their minds, when that happened, never to be seen again. You know, they believed that they were destroyed and they were gone. These guys lost so much. They gave up so much as a result of their sin. Yet God was amazingly gracious 
with them and he restored those things. That's, that's the heart of the Lord, guys. Many of you guys have experienced, again, look at modern day application, you've experienced just that. Sin in your life has destroyed. Sin in your life has, has uh, taken things away from you of value. Maybe relationships. Maybe things that you never even acknowledged were a gift from the Lord. And you lost them. And, and sin came in with a cost. And all of those things, relationships and things that were valuable, were lost as a consequence of sin. But in God's mercy, and we see story after story after story, not only does he forgive, but he restores. And he makes families whole. And he does incredible things in his mercy. Often, God restores what we destroy. Um, chapter 2, Ezra. I'm going to take a drink because there's like a thousand names here. I, I'm not going to try to read any of them. <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 1. Now these are the people of the providence who came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his own city. Those who came with Zerubbabel were Jeshua, Nehemiah, and then the list begins. Let me ask you this. Why would this list be so important? Why would a list of names here matter? Because I'll tell you, it was very, very important to them. Genealogy, yeah, that's important. And not just so we could, you know, look through here and pick out awesome baby names. <laughs> Property, yeah. That, that would have been very, very significant. That, that when you went back to this destroyed, desolate land, you would know this family, it, it, this belongs to this, this deed belongs to that family. But not just property, what else? What, jobs, duties, roles, right? If you, if you were to be a priest, that wasn't something that you could just study for or, or aspire to be. You had to be um, a descendant of Aaron. You had to be of, of the tribe of Levi, you know? So all of those things were very, very important. Pretty cool. You wonder, these guys going back, like I said, it was a, a, a big leap of faith. Psalm 126, I want to look at that really quick because that reveals their heart to us. What these guys were going through, what they were feeling, a joyful return to Zion, a, son of a, a song of ascents. Psalm 126, verse 1 says, When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion... We were like those who dream. It didn't even seem real. It was like a dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Imagine that transition coming out of bondage. In that time, they were asked to sing and they were like, no, we can't. We, we, we can't even. There's the joy. Bring back, verse 4, bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. So they're like busting out the harps or whatever, you know, and just singing praises to, the, to God as they come back, bringing his sheaves with him. Uh, if you skip all the way down in chapter 2, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to read them all, but I, I want to highlight a couple things. Verse 23. The men of Anathoth, 183. Does that, or one, 128. Wow. That's not even dyslexia, right? That was just a mess. 128. The men of An Anathoth. What is the significance of that? Um, that actually was the, the area that the prophet Jeremiah was from. And again, you want to talk about things that don't make sense to our friends and family. Don't make, friends sometimes, don't make sense sometimes to our husbands or our wives. When the Lord instructs us to do something, this, the men of Anathoth, when we look at, in Jeremiah, chapter 32, verses 6 through 8, it says, And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalem, your uncle, will come to you saying, buy my field, which is where? Don't even try to say it. Anathoth. 
for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. Buy this field. Why would you buy a field when you're getting ready to be taken into captivity? It doesn't make sense, right? Then Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, please buy my field that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is yours and the redemption yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. So though it probably didn't make sense to anyone else around him, and, and Jeremiah seeks an explanation from God later in the chapter. If you, if you go, um, Jeremiah 32 down to verse 25, and it says, And you have said to me, O Lord God, buy the field for money and take witnesses. Yet the city has been given into the hand of Chaldeans. See, this was a promise from God that they were going to return. Let's keep going. Verse 26. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Verse 28. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. You guys see? I want you to see. Prophecy is real. The scriptures all tie in together. They all speak of Jesus as well. But this is amazing. Daniel, uh, Haggai, we'll get there. Jeremiah, Isaiah, it all ties in exactly what we're talking about, this captivity. King of Babylon, and he shall take it. Verse 29, and the Chaldeans who fight against the city shall come and set fire to the city and burn it with the houses on whose roofs they have offered incense to Baal and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger, this idolatry. Because the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done only evil before me from their youth, for the children of Israel have provoked me only to anger with the works of their hands, says the Lord. Verse 31, for this city has been to me a provocation of my anger and my fury from the day that they built it, even to this day. So I will remove it from before my face because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Uh, further down, verse 36, Jeremiah 32. Now therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all my countries where I've driven them in my anger and my fury and in great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Jeremiah, I know it doesn't make sense. Men of Anath, I know it doesn't make sense to buy this title deed when this is going to happen, but... There's an end to this story. They shall be my people. I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart. Think of the unity that God expresses in that. These people are going to gather back together. I'm going to give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. Verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great calamity on this people, so I will bring them all the good that I have promised them. I brought this calamity, but my promise hasn't gone away. I'm going to bring all the good of my promise. And fields will be bought in this land of which you say it's desolate, Without man or beast, it has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for money, sign deeds and seal them, and take witness in the land of Benjamin, and the places around Jerusalem, and the cities of Judah, and the cities of the mountains, and the cities of the lowland, and the cities of the south. For I will cause their captives to return, say the Lord. So don't underestimate what's in genealogies. I'm sure there's something very important in each line. Like you said, it was extremely important to them. That was just one that stood out <clears throat> to me going through it. Um, verse six, 36, back in Ezra chapter 2, in this list, he starts um, naming the priests, the priests that have returned. And then down in verse 40, then he lays out the Levites. 
um, the sons of Jeshua and Cadmiel. And then down in verse 41, the singers, the sons of Asaph. Remember, Asaph was like the worship leader. Tw uh, I think 12 of our Psalms are written by Asaph. So 128 of him. Verse 42, then the gatekeepers. We talked about them as we went through um, 2 Chronicles, those that, that guarded Jerusalem and the temple. And then down verses 43 through 58, we've got the servants, the temple servants, the sons of Solomon's servants. Uh, verse 59, we begin to see that some of them, remember the, the, how important these names and genealogies were? In verse 59, we see that some of them couldn't identify their lineage. It, they, they couldn't spell it out. They couldn't prove it. So with that, not only maybe they couldn't get their land back, but they couldn't do certain things. That could be because the value of it, as they were in captivity or they were born in captivity and then they came back, they didn't recognize the value of it or, or it had weaned because they were so intermingled with the Babylonians and the Persians. And it was difficult to trace. Trace Down in verse 62, we see it affected some specifically because they couldn't be priests, because they couldn't prove their, their lineage. Uh, these sought their listings among those who were registered by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled because they didn't have proof. For 64, the whole assembly together was 42,360. So this would have been the males of the families that, that first assembled, and then others would have come. That's why I said that number is, is, uh, varies from 50,000 to 150,000. For 65, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 70,337, and they had 200 men and women singers, Verse 66, their horses were 736, their mules 245, uh, their camels 435, lists all the things that they brought. 68, some of the heads of the father's houses when they came to the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to erect it in its place. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury of the work 61,000 gold drachmas, 5,000 minas of silver and 100 priestly garments. So they contributed. They weren't just excited. They actually gave towards the restoration of the temple. Verse 70, so the priests and the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. Chapter 3, we'll do quick. And when, verse 1, the seventh month had come. The children of Israel were in the cities and the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Remember, it just said one heart. That was the, the type of unity that they came together in. Verse two, then Jeshua, the son of Zadok, and his brother and the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren arose and built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries. They set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening burnt offerings. So understand, guys, two million people were taken out of there and just a small, tiny remnant came back. So they were small in number. They, they were afraid, afraid of the people around them. This altar was... Seeking God for direction. It was seeking God for protection from those around him and wanted to acknowledge their complete dependence on God. So they would start their day with these offerings and they would end their day. The very last thing they did at the end of the day was make these offerings. That's, that's, there's some good application for us that we would start our day with the Lord, guys. And, and it's important. We've talked about that in the marriage groups, doing this with your husband and wife, but it's important that we do that alone with the Lord too. Start our day with the Lord, end our day with the Lord. Verse four says, they also kept the feast of tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings and the number required by the ordinance for each day. Verse five, afterwards they offered the regular burnt offering and those for new, new moons 
and for all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. Verse 7, they also gave money to the masons and to the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. So before they built the temple, before they did any of that, they restored the altar. They wanted to reestablish worship. They, again, they, they were fear. They were in fear of the nations around them. They were looking for direction. They were looking for protection. But also, those that came back, again, not all of them had been in Jerusalem and came back. Some were born in captivity. So specifically, the Feast of Tabernacles, you guys know about that? It, it, um, kind of like our camping. They literally would set up tents. And, and they would go out and they set up tents and the kids would be like, why in the world are we doing this? Because we want you to remember our, our people had to travel. We, we were in, in wilderness and we would be guided by a pillar of fire by night and a, and a cloud by day. And, and we were wanderers like this. So they would go out and do that so that their kids would remember where they came from and what they were delivered from coming into the promised land. So they did all these things to begin with. Verse 8 says, Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, Jeshua, the son of Zedoak, and the rest of the brethren, and the priests, and the Levites, and all those who had come out of captivity of Jerusalem, began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Joshua with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel with his sons, and the sons of Judah arose as one to oversee those working in the house of God. The sons of Henadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpeters, with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. So good start. They're able to worship. They're able to praise the Lord. Check it out. For he is good for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But, verse 12, Many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple, remember in all of its splendor, they wept when they saw this humble temple that was reconstructed by this remnant. They wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. So there were those that, that came and they were just so grateful to be able to restore worship to the Lord. And they saw this and they just praised God. Or maybe they had been born in bondage, born in captivity, and they came out and this was the first glimpse. But the priests and the Levites, when they were looking back, looking back to what once had been and what their sin had cost them, but they were comparing, comparing the temples, comparing a, a time of old to today. And it says they wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Verse 13, so the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of weeping the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. Can you imagine that chaos? We've got a group of people here in the middle on a Sunday morning, praising God, arms lifted, and you've got people over here just sobbing and weeping because we're not singing hymns or because we swapped switch something up on the worship team or it's not what it once was or whatever. I mean, that's what's going on. But one, one more cross-reference just because that seems to be what we're doing tonight. The book of Haggai. Turn to the book of Matthew and then go left, like three little books. <laughs> and you'll find it. Haggai chapter two. Now, Haggai and Zechariah were, were raised up, both raised up during the time of this rebuilding, really specifically to encourage the people. 
So Haggai chapter two, I'll just read a few verses here. <clears throat> Maybe. <coughs> wow. I made it this far. In the, se <clears throat> in the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, <coughs> saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, here's the message you're to give to them. Verse 3, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with this, is this not in your eyes as nothing? You're comparing it to the old temple, and in your eyes, this is nothing. Verse 4, <coughs> Yet now, be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Listen, this guy is saying this, and, and this guy is saying that, and it might not be what it once was, but I'm saying work. Do what I've told you to do. Do you guys ever get discouraged in ministry? In the ministry that the Lord has called you to? Or maybe the ministry that the Lord has called you to is a small thing, or it seems like a small thing? where people compare whatever you're doing, however you're serving, and, and somebody will talk about their church and how big their youth program is or how, how big their men's breakfast is or how big their, their Sunday morning attendance is. Can you, do, you, do you get discouraged like that? It's, it's easy to do. And, and sometimes other people compare you to other people, but sometimes we can do that to ourselves. And we can think, well, I've been doing this for a long time. I did a, a law enforcement Bible study for a lot of years, and that could fluctuate in number into the high 20s, and a lot of times it was two or three, you know? But the Lord calls us to be faithful, and the results are up to him. So God says, I'm with you. I'm with you in this work, so keep going. Do what I've asked you to do, and the results are up to me. A New England version of that, do your job. You know, God says, do your job. Keep going. Be faithful in what I've called you to do. So there's some application. We'll end with that. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. <coughs> Excuse me. Just to spend time with you, Lord. And, and how amazing it is how your word tells